Welcome to Reactive DDD, Scale Your Domain Models. I'm the chief architect, actually the founder and chief architect of the Reactive platform Vlingo. This is available in Java and in .NET. You can read more about it in vlingo.io. Uh, the website, our documentation, is at docs.vlingo.io. And you can find the source code for Java at github.com slash vlingo and the .NET source code at github.com slash vlingo dash net. We're continuing on our discussion of reactive. What is reactive? Reactive is message driven at sort of its foundation. Reactive operates by passing messages and passing messages asynchronously. This is the primary driver in being able to uh, accomplish resiliency, elasticity, and responsiveness. And in addition to that, you should be using with Reactive some sort of tooling that is maintainable and makes your resulting services maintainable and also makes them extensible. So the platform itself or the tool set that you're using should be extensible as well as uh, the services or applications that you're creating with it. Why reactive? Fundamentally, when you use plain old objects, so plain old Java objects or plain old C sharp objects, for example, this client object wants to ask the server object to do something. Now, just to make it clear, this client is not a remote client and the server is not a remote server. These are running in the same uh, language virtual machine. So the client makes a method invocation on the server and the client blocks. That means that until the server completes, the client will not gain uh, control again. And when the server gets control, it may have other things that it is dependent on to serve whatever uh, service it, it's providing. And if that server relies on other things, the server will block as well. So this is a typical pattern. It's something that we become quite accustomed to. In fact, it, it actually helps us to reason about software to know that when we make a method invocation, nothing else happens until that method invocation returns to us. However, this also makes it difficult to write software that scales and that performs well, because whenever the software blocks, nothing is happening to the left-hand side on the left-hand side of this diagram. On the other hand, reactive is about asynchronous message sending and the actor model, which is what Vlingo supports, is all about asynchrony. However, as it is an asynchronous model, the individual objects themselves, such as the client and the server, are actually single threaded. So this is an interesting model because uh, asynchrony, concurrency, parallelism, uh, depending on the number of cores that you have and what can be executed simultaneously, is being done in a way that the inside of the object itself is very familiar with, single threading. Alan Kay, the person who coined the term object-oriented, noted that the actor model retains most of what he considered the good ideas of object-oriented. And one of those things that the actor model supports is what Alan Kay 
said was the big idea, and that is the big idea is messaging. So when this client wants to tell the server object, again, the client is an object and the server is an object in the same language virtual machine, it sends a non-blocking asynchronous message. Now, if you're using the approach that Vlingo uses, it can actually look just like a normal method invocation. So with Vlingo, the client actor actually makes a method invocation to the server. It's type safe. It's a type safe message invocation. And this is what gives the server a message to process at some point in time. The client then immediately continues because after this uh, message send, it still has the thread that it is currently operating on. And even if the server is using a thread right now to manage a previously delivered message, it will not process that message that it receives immediately. It will have to wait for some policy um, uh, to determine, do I see n number of messages uh, or I do see n number of messages uh, after I complete this message, um, will that n number of messages afterward be zero or will it be uh, some number that requires um, the server to handle that immediately while it still has the thread and then one message at a time will be de delivered to it. So um, basically you can design an actor's mailbox to say um, with with a mailbox policy that says I can when I have a thread I can process n number of total messages and that number can be one to many one or many now when you consider where we've been with software running on hardware from far back we were very accustomed to having a single processor so when i started writing code in the early 1980s i was writing code mostly against the 8088 processor that was found on the ibm pc and other clone machines that processor was replaced within a few years when there was uh, um, uh, some engineering advancement made and that was known as the 286 processor the the 8286 and what that represented was not parallel processing or the capability to run multiple threads at a time but to uh, uh, be able to, to do um, a, do better at multi-processing as in you could be running multiple processes at one time but all of them were passing through the single thread which means that some process would be blocked uh, or paused while another process was running and this was called task switching this trend continued with the 386 the 486 the Pentium so the 586 and then somewhere along the line and I'm not even uh, certain I remember exactly what processor number was uh, was Intel manufacturing at the time but around the year 2003 this trend changed we were seeing uh, based on a, a law or a prediction that Adrian Moore made in the 1960s, a doubling of clock speed on processors about every 18 months. Uh, he actually predicted about every 24 months, but it ended up being even better than that. So we saw a doubling in processor speed about every 18 months. Well, this trend, this prediction started to fail at about the year 2003. And there were several different reasons for it. One being that the processor manufacturers could no longer 
cool the chip as uh, clock speeds got faster on the processors. So the processors would overheat and so they couldn't make those uh, exponential I increases in uh, <clears throat> clock speed and ultimately single processor power. So what did Intel and others start doing? They started creating the ability to process two things at a time. And the way they did that was they took the original processor and hyper-threaded it. This means that you could have two threads running through the processor at once instead of two. So now task switching could be done on and and if you had uh, 100 processes running in, on your machine, <clears throat> then two of those would be operating at any given time instead of just one. So instead of having 99 uh, paused processes, you would have 98 paused processes. But um, you could now uh, send those processes through task switching at double the rate that you could initially. So this was a gain to some extent, but the cores themselves were not becoming faster. Today, what we actually have are multiple cores running hyper-threading. So if you have two cores, you have four, the capability of running four simultaneous threads. And if you have four cores, that number increases to eight simultaneous threads. Eight cores would be 16 simultaneous threads, and so forth. So, while the processors are not getting faster, the many cores within them is what makes, uh, gives us the potential for not only keeping pace, but running software overall much faster than we did previously. Today, we're going to focus less on the performance part overall of using threads uh, to, to scale. But what we're going to do is look at, well, we will be looking at how threads help us to scale, but we'll also be looking at how multiple language virtual machines help us to scale. This is where message-driven supports elastic growth of, say, a, a services or an applications cluster and responsiveness where the uh, application can continue to respond equally to the kind of throughput it's re receiving at any given time, even if the load increases dramatically, then we start scaling out and the elasticity of the software cluster that we're using remains responsive overall. So this is our focus for today. And because we're scaling out and we're also uh, doing all we can to cache the important objects in our solution, whether that's a microservice or an application, so whether we're scaling, uh, whatever we're doing, we're attempting to cache the important or hot objects in memory. And well, look at what we have today. We can buy 256 gigabytes of RAM for $1,325. That's amazing. Now, if you go back to that age of uh, 8386 machine that I spoke about before, uh, you know, I, I had to pay $1,000 per um, megabyte of RAM back then to run Unix. So I had a 386 uh, desktop machine and I ran a Unix on it, and of course you had to have at least one megabyte of RAM, and those cards cost $1,000 each. So if I wanted two megabytes of RAM, $2,000. And look at where we are today. This is really pretty amazing. And of course, this supports um, our, have, you know, giving us the ability to cache a lot of objects in RAM. The network also matters. When the actor model was originally uh, discovered and, and, and worked on, um, networks were very slow and unreliable, but there was a vision about networks becoming uh, much faster and much more reliable. 
and much more broadly available. And this also plays in to our uh, ability to distribute the solutions that we create across many different uh, virtual machines, as in um, hardware virtual machines. Drives also matter. While we do attempt to cache as many objects in memory as we possibly can, some of those objects will obviously not fit in, in memory. Even with a gigantic cluster, you will still have cases where some objects will not fit into that gigantic cluster. It, it just becomes a point of um, you know, negative or, or minimal returns, uh, diminishing returns, when we scale out so far that uh, the performance of networks and so forth may make it impractical to have extremely large clusters. Um, and so what we have is the need to back up uh, the memory. And so our actors can be, their state can be persisted to databases or some kind of uh, file uh, storage mechanism. Now notice 12 terabytes of storage actually begs us to store things on disk. $350 for 12 terabytes of storage. Again, that's amazing. As you can see, all arrows are pointing toward large scale, and so we have to be able to, to produce large scale in order to uh, solve the problems that we have today. Now, you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, why do I need this? Because actually, we don't scale beyond maybe a three node or 10 node or 50 node cluster. Why do we need you know, such uh, scalability? Well, the, the point is actually that if you have a 50 node cluster, chances are good that with Reactive, you could probably serve that um, equally well with a five node cluster. And because the five node cluster of Reactive is not blocking, the 50 node uh, cluster is blocking. Okay. If you have a 100 node cluster now running uh, uh, Java um, Enterprise Edition, for example, an app server, or any kind of web server that is completely blocking, then using Reactive will likely, you'll, you'll be able to run uh, those in, in perhaps 10% of the number of nodes because of the non-blocking characteristic of Reactive. So even if you don't have tremendously large scale, you can still benefit from uh, lowering the cost of any given solution. Now, I just have to say that a few years ago, people were um, echoing the CIO's sentiment of, hey, you know, this cloud stuff, it, it's, uh, I don't care how much it costs, I just want everything on the cloud. You know, buy more and more and more uh, um, virtual machines in the cloud and push everything over there. Well, I think that after this sort of, you know, rampant push to uh, the cloud, I think that CIOs are waking up now and saying, oh, wow, this is costing us a lot of money every month or every year. Boy, how could we get some of that uh, money back? You know, well, here's the thing, right? Then create software that doesn't block. And if you can reduce from 50 uh, virtual machines on AWS or Google Cloud Platform or Azure or whatever, it happens to be, uh, if you can reduce that down to five, well, that's a, a pretty good deal for your CIO's budget. To talk about DDD for a moment, um, well, if you know anything about DDD, you should know that the bounded context with a ubiquitous language is really the foundational you know, um, uh, uh, concept within domain-driven design. And the ubiquitous language is a language that's communicated on a team, so team communication is very important, and team communication with the business is, is extremely important, and that communication learns to, leads to learning, 
and learning leads to more communication and this develops over some uh, period of time a language and because this language has specific meaning to a given software model that language is housed in a context which says everything within this bounded context or context boundary has a specific meaning. So each of these five objects that you see here that are talking to one another, these are actors and these actors are named according to the concept that is learned and communicated by the ubiquitous language that's developed by the team. It's in a context which means that when I point to an object such as this one in the upper left, that object has specific uh, definition and meaning and protocol. What does it do and how does it do it? How do you map a bounded context up to Vlingo? Well, let's say we have concretely here something called a rate service. This rate service is responsible for calculating rates of insurance policies. So when someone applies for an insurance po policy, they want to know how much that will cost before they actually go through with attempting to purchase that policy. And if it's cost effective for them, then they will purchase it. So in their need to know what the rate will be, this bounded context, the rate service, as in the rate service bounded co or context uh, must provide that functionality. Internally, it's running a Vlingo world. A Vlingo world represents the highest level of abstraction for a single uh, instance of an actor model to operate. Within a world, we have what's called a stage. There is an initial stage that's created in behalf of the world, this is the default stage, and this is where the actors will actually exist and play, as it were, or function and send messages to, to one another. So the stage owns this set of actors. You can have multiple stages, and I'll explain in a few moments how uh, multiple stages helps with implementing scalability. But right now, think of a DDD bounded context as existing within a world stage. This is where the objects or actors uh, have a life cycle. So, Vlingo is DDD friendly. It's also a reactive platform. And this is where the two um, concepts play together. So, Vlingo is also friendly to DDD in the sense that multiple services can talk to each other and multiple services means multiple bounded contexts. So here on the upper left, we have this rate service. It is a bounded context. And for now, just think of this as a single language VM. So a single node running somewhere on a, on a piece of hardware, um, hardware virtual machine and a separate risk service at the lower right. And this is also a different bounded context. So the rate service has a ubiquitous language that is bounded and the risk service has a ubiquitous language that is bounded and the rate service knows how to talk to the risk service. But how does it know where the risk, risk service is? It uses what's called the Vlingo directory and the Vlingo directory is where services register their existence and the directory provides discovery by sending out continuous pulses of uh, information to each service saying, here's where the services are that you are interested in using. And if it is a service that you're interested in using, then um, you'll want to retain where that service exists. So for example, the rate service now knows where the risk service is because of the directory. The risk service has registered itself with the Lingo directory and the, the rate service has registered itself and the directory 
tells the rate service, here's where the risk service is. So this is a, a microservices architecture now because we have two microservices running, rate service and risk service, but each of these are a bounded context. Now, I just want to say one thing here to clarify. It doesn't mean that this is the final definition of what a microservice is, but if you have watched my other uh, presentations or um, sat through my workshops and, and participated in the, in the workshop exercises, you know that I recommend starting out with a bounded context as a microservice. And uh, by doing that, <clears throat> pardon me, by doing that, you have a, a very sort of safe position of not over-engineering the microservice world. And I can get into that more in another session. So within the rate service, let's zoom in on some objects. Well, we're still looking a bit abstractly here, but within a world stage, notice that in our domain model, we have three different entities. An entity such as that on the left side of the diagram extends the abstract base type of object entity, which means that this entity will have persistence against an object store. Because this entity can also uh, emit domain events from, uh, from the entity, from itself, then uh, an object store also has a journal that is, uh, is used to persist domain events in the order in which they occurred, and therefore the object store provides transactionality, asset transactions, atomic commits, that say when the state of the entity is written and any domain events, they are written together um, in, in a single transaction. In the middle of this diagram, we have a different kind of entity. This entity uses a journal. Let's say this journal is used for event sourcing. So the entity would be an event sourced entity and its state is represented by the stream of domain events that it produces. On the right-hand side, the entity here is called a stateful entity, and the stateful entity uses a state store with a journal to uh, write key value states. So the identity of the entity will be the key, and a clob or blob will represent the state of that entity. And this entity type can also emit domain events, and those domain events will be persisted transactionally uh, with asset atomic transactions in the state store along with that uh, state club or, or blob against a key. So um, I'll go into these a bit more, but this is where domain modeling with entities, for example, is uh, simplified quite greatly by having an auto persistence mechanism that uh, manages the state of each of these um, base types of entities, and therefore you have a choice as to what kind of persistence you use. Again, these are entities within the rate service ubiquitous language. The storage engines that are supported are currently DynamoDB, Apache Geode. We also support several JDBC uh, flavors such as um, the JDBC drivers of Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, Yugabyte, and HSQLDB. And I just want to point out one thing that while the Postgres database is extremely popular as uh, an open source database, the Yugabyte database has a personality of Postgres. It also has a personality of other kinds of storage engines, but what we use is the Postgres personality of Yugabyte, and you get global scale, um, a global scale Postgres database with asset transactions 
uh, because of that. So anything that runs for Postgres in Vlingo runs for Yugabyte in Vlingo. Soon we'll be uh, announcing uh, fast scalable journals. So um, yes, Postgres is fast, but Postgres is not as highly scalable as um, Yugabyte is. But what about journals? What about event source journals, for example? We'll be announcing that soon. So Vlingo is also a reactive compute grid. Using what's known as the Vlingo cluster and Vlingo lattice, we have a powerful combination that supports um, the rate service having the ability to elastically scale. So for example, the rate service in this diagram has a node one, a node two, and a node three. What this means is these are separate Java virtual machines. So separate processes that have uh, the, are enabled to talk to each other, not only about the health of the cluster, but also to communicate. So Vlingo cluster gives that sort of backbone of, um, of being able to scale the Java virtual machine across several hardware uh, servers. And it also facilitates the, uh, uh, the or I should say that uh, Vlingo Lattice facilitates the ability for actors in those different nodes to send messages to one another. And therefore, Vlingo can serve as a compute grid where actors can be scaled uh, quite broadly and the actors do not lose communication just because they land on a separate VM, on a separate um, uh, hardware uh, virtual machine, and, or across a network that may span a nation or even continents. And with Vlingo Lattice, you have not only uh, a compute grid, but you also have a clustered data fabric. So it could be that you want certain actors to be simply caches of well-known pieces of data. And these can be scaled as well. And also, uh, at the same time, the grid objects, the grid actors, can use that cached data. And so you, you sort of have the best of, of all worlds, whether it, you need a data cache, uh, a data grid, or both of those at the same time. And all of this is reactive. So it, uh, it uses or has, it, it, it uh, has the capabilities of a full reactive definition, message driven, responsive, elastic, and resilient. Let me uh, take you a little bit further into the object entity abstract base type. This is provided by Vlingo Lattice. And this base type, as you see here at the lower left-hand corner, is called object entity. And the rate entity in this diagram extends the object entity base type and notice that the rate entity needs to persist its state, which is the yellow box, and one or more domain events, which is the orange box. And so when it needs to do that, it doesn't even know that or have to know that it's persisting anything because it's a simple uh, operation that where the rate says, I want to apply this new state and one or, or zero or more domain events to myself. Behind the scenes, the object entity uh, asynchronously speaks to the object store and persists atomically both the state and zero or more domain events. As you can see, the object entity supports OR mapping object relational mapping, and therefore the object store is, is working with, for example, JPA, uh, Hibernate, 
um, and, and we even support a very lightweight sort of mapping, which you might not really consider OR mapping, but it's called JDVI. And this is very close to, uh, um, very near to, to SQL or SQL. And by means of this, we can save state into, for example, the rates table, and we can save uh, events into a journal table, and that all happens transactionally. The stateful entity is an abstract base type for persisting with key value pairs. So let's say that we want to use a NoSQL approach and our rate object uh, has a state and zero or more domain events that it wants to apply to itself. So it simply applies it to itself. And when it applies that new state, the stateful entity abstract type takes care of persisting that new state to a key value store. This could be DynamoDB, or it could be uh, simply a, a primary key identity with um, a clob or blob uh, uh, serialization of the rate state, and that could be saved into Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, um, or, or any of the, the other JDBC databases such as Yugabyte. So you then have key value storage along with persistence of any domain events, and all of that happens with ACID uh, transactions atomically. And thirdly, we have the uh, event sourced abstract base class and the abstract base class event sourced here is extended by rate. So this is showing you that you have uh, three different uh, options for persisting rate. You may want to choose OR mapping, you may want to choose key value, you may want to choose uh, event sourced. And each of these have their strengths and, and their challenges um, you know, sort of pros and cons to, to usage. So choose the one that works best for you. In this case, an event sourced rate mostly saves domain events. So it applies to itself its own domain event, one or more domain events, and those events are asynchronously persisted to a journal. And the journal persists streams. The rate that you see here, if, if it represents a single rate, let's say simply with the unique identity of one, so a rate with an ID of one, there will be a stream, a single stream of events for this rate ID of one in this journal. And the events are saved into the table, in, into the journal table, which could be, um, you know, any of the uh, JDBC databases or other kinds of databases. And again, as I said, we'll be uh, announcing um, highly scalable, very performant um, uh, journals, implementations of the Vlingo journal in the near future. Not only does the journal save streams of individual rates, it sa saves streams of any kind of entity, uh, event sourced entity in your domain model in a totally ordered stream also within the journal. So now we're going to have a demonstration by Alexandros and take it away Alexandros, show us how the Vlingo lattice grid works. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Alexandros, and as Paul already mentioned, I've been working with him on the implementation of Flingo Lattice Grid over the last three months. Flingo Lattice Grid is a distributed implementation of stage from Vlingo Actors. If you're not familiar with the concept of stage, it is part of Vlingo Actors API for starting actors. Grid implements the stage API, enabling you to distribute Flingo Actors across a cluster of nodes in a network. The grid builds on top of Flingo Cluster, using its features to maintain the cluster state in a hash ring data structure. We use the hash ring to make decisions about which actor should start on which node based on the hash value of the actor's address. The grid currently supports the redistribution of actors as you add new nodes to the cluster, 
and support for recovery of actors previously running on a node that left the cluster is coming soon. The example for today's day demo, although a bit contrived, it serves well to demonstrate all of the features that are currently supported. This example is based on the ping pong example, which some of you may be familiar from the Bling Actors documentation. Without further ado, let's have a look at the code and run the example. On the left of my screen, you see the structure of the demo project. This is a standard Maven project. And in the POM XML file, you can see the dependencies to the required Blingo modules and some plugins. We use the Maven exec plugin to run this application from the console. In the main source folder, we see the entry point for the application, the protocol interface for our actors, and the actor implementations. The ping pong example um, is implemented to respond to each other's messages with a delay of two seconds. Uh, the ping pong referee is what starts the ping pong game. There's a single method, whistle, which accepts a name for the node where this referee started and responds with a finger. Finger and ponger are mostly the same. We accept a ponger as an argument for the finger and the node name, and the same for the ponger. Implementation of the referee is simple. Print a message to the console, then starts a pinger as a child actor of this referee instance, and returns that to the client. Pinger also prints a message to the console, waits for two seconds, and calls the pong method of the ponger that was passed in as an argument. Let's have a look at the main method to see how we start the grid and these distributed actors. The node name is coming in from the command line argument, and it's used as an argument to the start method of the grid along with the name of the world that we are going to start. <clears throat> the application then starts an instance of a ponger using the actor for method on the grid. It starts a ping pong referee actor and calls the whistle method, passing in the node name. When whistle returns, we call ping on the pinger. And this is essentially what is starting the game. The API for starting actors on the grid are the same as you would expect from actors. The only difference is that you need to keep a reference on the grid. In the resources folder, you will find the cluster configuration properties file. Here, we configure the host names and ports for each of the nodes that are in the cluster. And we also specify the name for each node. These are the names that we use in our application. Furthermore, we need to include the names of all the nodes that we want to participate in the cluster, set to the seed nodes property of cluster. As you see, there are several properties you can configure for cluster. You can find detailed descriptions of what each of these uh, property does in the documentation of Lingo cluster. So let's run this program and see what happens. The terminal, I use the Maven exec plugin to start the first node in our cluster. If 
As you see, the node starts and the actors are running. Let's add the second node and see what happens. Okay, as you see, the actor started from node one, they run on node one, and the actor started on node two, they run on node two. This is because the address of these actors, they happen to hash to the nodes that we see here inside the hash ring. Let's see what happens when we add the third node. Hopefully it will be a bit more lucky this time. So the node starts, as we see here, the pinger moved from, of node 1 moved from node 1 to node 3. The actor started on node 3, they immediately started on different nodes. The pinger is on node 2 and the ponger is on node 1. Sorry, this one. That's all I have for you today. I look forward to seeing what you built on Blingo Lattice Grid, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Again, thank you for joining us. Thanks for the demo, Alexandros. That was very interesting. A simple demo, but demonstrating the important parts of our compute grid and uh, data fabric. So Vlingo is also a uh, supporting event-driven architecture. So as you see, domain events are supported through all three of our uh, persistence types, as in um, object entity, stateful entity, and event sourced entity. So now we get into seeing that the rate service talks to the risk service, and the, in the insurance industry, a an applicant you know let's say submits an application into an application intake uh, context and this would be at the upper left somehow uh, and you can't see that right now that that application intake but actually in in the case here with the rate service it somehow knows that a new application has been submitted uh, for for obtaining a policy, an insurance policy. This rate service then finds that out. Let's say it happens through a domain event. Now the rate service has to rapidly calculate an insurance rate, but it can't do that without asking uh, the risk service, what is the risk on uh, insuring this kind of applicant with application? And the risk service there uh, calculates the risk and the calculation of the risk um, goes back to the exchange that is a middleware exchange. So for example, Kafka, RabbitMQ, SNS, whatever you happen to be using. Um, and when you persist to this exchange uh, service, a, a domain event, that exchange service or the, the exchange or topic will then be uh, will push that new domain event message out to a subscriber in the rate service. The rate service turns that into uh, a command. It says, let me take what this domain event means to us, and I will translate to that to a command, and that command will uh, have some operation to perform on the entity in the middle of the rate service there. So we'll get into more detail about this uh, next week, and we'll do that by explaining what is a published language, why, when bounded contexts exchange information do, through a published language, why, how is it that we actually accomplish um, exchanging that information in a safe way? 
So we're going to, ex to explain next week how a schema registry uh, can be used to define, for example, the commands that a bounded context would send to another bounded context and what events may come out of the other bounded context back to the command submitting bounded context. Or if the, if the bounded context needs to query for information, what is the shape and identification and uh, um, structure and meaning of the data that we receive in the query, that is the white um, objects on the right-hand side of the schema registry. So next week we'll be explaining how the Vlingo Schemata schema registry works and we'll go into that uh, in a lot of detail. In a few weeks we'll also be looking at Vlingo Zoom. Vlingo Zoom is our uh, bootstrap. This is how you can quickly uh, come up to speed using Vlingo. Uh, rapidly boot. You can have a new microservice working in a very uh, uh, rapid way. And here's where you see the rate service is scaling across um, a, a cluster of three nodes. And the cluster, again, with the actors, are all uh, talking to one another through the lattice grid. But then this Vlingo Zoom component is what is used to, to quickly boot and bring components in to your rate service that are needed by by each of uh, the services or the entities or whatever your domain model uh, represents and other tooling that you have, you can bring in these through our micro framework very easily. So the, the platform support that we have for Vlingo, I just wanted to go through this very briefly, is budget friendly. And I will tell you that there probably is no other uh, platform software that can come close to uh, saving money in your IT budget and still um, supporting developers quite readily through either monthly support, a very low cost monthly support for individual developers, annual support for individual developers that have, and all of these have a range of SLA. So what are, what are the timeframes that we are um, going to, to answer? you within and when we have to patch and so forth, which of these uh, developer support services provides patches. We also have team level. So I think if you uh, have a uh, multiple teams that number, uh, uh, you know, less than 30, then the team support license could work for you. And the enterprise packages are then I think 30 or more developers. So if you're going to really scale Vlingo across uh, development teams, we have a package for you. Um, the production support, so we have uh, named or priced uh, three node cluster, five node cluster, which frankly will probably be um, what most projects will need, uh, or enterprise packages if you need uh, very highly scalable um, cluster support with, with Blingo, Grid, and Fabric. I also am uh, introducing now the online learning that will be available in a few weeks. This is, these are half-day online workshops. So on April 8th, I'll be presenting domain modeling with entities. So this is a deep dive workshop with using DDD entities. Um, on April 15th, domain modeling with value objects. So now we'll take a deep dive into um, using value objects. How do we design value objects? What sort of behaviors should value objects have? And what are, what's the flexibility in, in, in using value objects? On April 22nd, uh, domain modeling with aggregates. So we bring together entities and value objects and form uh, aggregates out of those. How do we use aggregates in domain modeling? This will also go into the persistence of aggregates 
and um, and it will also uh, talk about um, other aspects of aggregate design and how aggregates can talk to one another um, through domain events. On the 29th of April, I will then take a deep dive into, okay, how do we design domain events? Is there a difference between domain events and other kinds of events? Um, what about the messaging patterns that are necessary to use with domain events? And how do we safely exchange information across um, bounded contexts? And I want to point out too that part of the messaging patterns that will be discussed here is the process manager, so how, uh, or what is, can also be referred to as sagas, how is it that we design process managers and sagas to safely exchange information across bounded context through um, a, pro a, st a process of multiple steps that need to be um, uh, completed. Then in May, I start the really simple series. Uh, on the 6th of May, really simple functional domain-driven design. You will learn how to use functional programming in a very simplistic way um, to accomplish domain-driven design. And I want you to know that if you've been intimidated by functional programming before, you will not be intimidated by uh, this workshop. But that doesn't mean that this workshop is dumbed down. It means that it is purposely designed by me, uh, known as you know, uh, a champion of simplicity. And, and I'm going to teach you how to use non-intimidating functional programming with most aspects of functional programming within domain-driven design. On the 13th of May, I uh, take you through a half-day deep dive on reactive programming, and this can be applied to any reactive platform such as Reactive Streams, um, RxJava, and, and so forth, or uh, you know, we'll also look at how reactive programming applies to Vlingo. And uh, on the 20th of May, I'll look at really simple event-driven REST APIs. So if you want to find out how to uh, design REST APIs that not only work with request response, but also work in a streaming manner, I will uh, show you how that will work and where your entire uh, system solution could be entirely REST-based and still be quite reliable, uh, as reliable as, as any sort of um, if you were using messaging middleware. So all of these are offered on a limited seat basis at a low cost. Our introductory price is $150 per workshop per uh, student, so half day of workshop on each of these subjects for $150 with limited seating. You can uh, review the details about each one of these at idddworkshop.com and you can also register there and we have registration times both for um, that are EU or Europe friendly Central European time or US um, Eastern Central uh, Mountain and Pacific times that that work out very well for those in the US and if you need to attend in Europe after working hours well you have the option of joining the US uh, time zone you know friendly uh, classes which will take place during your evening uh, into the night so welcome you to attend that and let's uh, I hope to see you or uh, exchange information with you um, next week and notice we're safely exchanging information through webinars. And um, look forward to seeing you next week as we uh, discuss the Vlingo Schemata Schema Registry. Take care until then.